All right, the next portion of our discussion of carbohydrates involves describing the two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional molecules that have chirality. We're going to use this thing called Fisher projections, and I alluded to them in the previous recording, telling you that the chiral carbon is going to be represented as an intersection of cross lines like we see here. And what you have to think about is these 3D molecules are unique in their geometries around a chiral carbon, but there must be a way to represent them that we can make sense of, or at least use in a consistent way to be able to um, compare one structure to another and see what's going on. So uh, the molecule at the left, W, X, Y, Z, are the four unique groups, four disti distinct groups on that chiral carbon. If you think about looking at this diagram from above, the, above it where the arrow is, and then the W and X are coming towards you and the Y and Z are going away from you. And think about laying it flat, pressing it flat on a plane of paper. That's what the next um, diagram is. The Y and Z are kind of vertical in your diagram. And the W and X are kind of horizontal. And so we rotate this over to the last box here so that Y and Z are, in fact, on the vertical bonds and the W and X are on the horizontal bonds. And what we have to do is say that this Fisher projection in implies that W and X are like the wedge bonds shown at the right, coming away from the plane of the diagram towards you, like they're going to grab you. And Z and Y go behind the plane of the paper, the diagram, whichever, away from you. Remembering car carbons have 109 or so degree tetrahedral geometry. They're not flat, whatever. But we tend to draw them on paper, and we need to understand these de um, representations without always drawing dashed lines and wedge bonds to represent um, overall geometry. So when you're writing a Fisher projection, what you do is, it's explained in this slide, it's kind of sort of described it to you already. You write the carbon chain so that the carbonyl group is at or nearest the top. That's important. You'll find that um, consistently used most of the time for carbohydrates. You put the chiral carbons as intersections of cross lines. And the substituents on the vertical lines are going behind the plane of the paper, away from you, the ones that are shown in blue here, away from you. And the ones on the horizontal lines, the ones that are in the red, are coming forward out of the plane of the paper towards you. And that's how we interpret those wedge bonds at the right as coming towards you. And the dashed lines is going away from you in those kind of representations. But we won't do that. We'll stick to this type of thing because we don't like to draw these artistic representations. We keep it a little bit simpler, but we have to have an understanding of what they mean. OK, so let's take simple molecules like glyceraldehyde. Three carbons, an OH group in the middle, LH group on the bottom, and aldehyde at the top. And the way this one is shown, the OH group on the left is coming towards you, which looks like what we see over here on the right with the ball and stick diagram. So all three of those. Um, representations at the top of the screen are implying the same thing. So the Fisher projection does it without drawing things in any kind of three-dimensional representation. It just is an, ex, um, an interpretation of how that's done. The molecule at the bottom of the page is, in fact, actually the same thing. But oh boy, if you had to figure that one out by looking at it, it would take us a little bit more thinking to get it right. So we'll use Fisher projections because they simplify our categorizing and um, recognizing different molecules. So whenever we're describing different stereoisomers, when there's mirror image forms, we said there was a D form and an L form. How do we know which ones are which? There's going to be two major groups depending on the arrangement of the atoms on the chiral carbon with the highest number on the carbon chain. So remember the aldehyde is always carbon 1. The numbers will proceed down the chain. We tend to draw them vertically. And the, the arrangement on that last chiral carbon will determine whether we describe it as a D or an L sugar. So the last or farthest from the carbonyl group determines D versus L. So a D sugar has the OH group in, on the right in that Fisher projection. D means dextro, like as in dexterity, honestly comes from the same root word. And the L sugars have the OH group on the left. And once you know what you're looking for, that's really not too hard to find. Thank goodness. Um, FYI, why is there a snail on this picture? That is another chiral substance. Um, snail shells are, in fact, chiral. You know, they have a spiral to them. OK, so there will be D sugars and there will be L sugars, and we will learn how to recognize them. Let's try it out. 
see what we can do here. Um, but think about our comparisons here first. You're going to want to be able to recognize them from the D and L isomers in the Fisher projections, but recognize that, uh, notice that all the biologically active carbohydrates, and this is my abbreviation, are going to be D isomers, D family, as opposed to amino acids that I talked about in another chapter. Those are going to be L isomers. Why? Because nature says so. We don't have to um, know any more reason than that, but that's the way nature does it. And so L amino acids and D sugars. The DNL designations have nothing to do with the rotation of plain polarized light for these stereoisomers, but that's just something that throws people off on occasion. But nope, it doesn't. That's something you have to figure out just by experimental evidence rather than trying to predict it. Okay, now let's see if we can use those designations and explain some things for this molecule here. Is it an aldose or a ketose? Is it D or is it L? Oh, let's see. Well, it's hexose apparently because it's got that in the name all the way. So one, two, three, four, five, six uh, carbons in this molecule. Is it an aldose or a ketose? Well, I hope you can see that carbon number two is a ketone, so it's not an aldose. And so is it D or is it L? It's determined by the orientation of the OH group on the highest numbered chiral carbon, and they're not shown with cross lines here. It's shown in detail, so you don't have to guess. It would be carbon number five. In this case, it's on the right, so it is a D keto hexose. D means it's on the right in this Fisher projection. Fair enough. So using what we talked about a little bit on the previous recording, how many possible stereoisomers would this funky molecule have? We don't have to know what its name is either, but that's all right. It's a, al a keto hexose, and it's in the D orientation. So be to begin with, um, how many chiral carbons are present? Let's notice them. Or is the top carbon chiral? Does it have four different groups? Uh, no, not chiral. It's got two hydrogens the same. Second carbon doesn't have four different groups because it's only got three things attached. How about the third carbon? Yep, that's chiral. The next one is also chiral. The next one is chiral also, so that would be three chiral carbons. So the number of chiral carbons is three. Notice, and this is going to fool you, um, the middle of those three has four unique groups attached. One is a hydrogen, one is an OH, one is CH and OH, but the rest of the molecule counts. And the one below it is CH and OH that looks the same, but the rest of the molecule is definitely different. So there's three chiral carbons indeed in this structure. So how many stereoisomers would it have? The, the formula then is two to the n. And so that would be two to the third. And if you're good with math or if you need a refresher, let's think about it. It's going to be two times two times two, which is eight possible stereoisomers. Aha. OK, so this is a ketohexose. And any ketohexose is going to have eight stereoisomers of it. Some of them are D and some of them are L. In this particular example, it was a D keto hexose. Now, I looked at, showed you this diagram with all these funny carbohydrates, um, including glucose. Glucose, I forgot to point it out for you, is up here in the top row. It's an aldohexose. And uh, we'll think about the number of possible stereoisomers there might be for each of these numerous structures. And in order to do so, it's being two to the n, you have to figure out the number of chiral carbons for each of them. All right, we can do this. So um, the chi chiral carbons are represented by the cross lines. And so I mentioned it before, if you heard the other recording, the number of chiral carbons in the aldohexoses is one, two, three, four cross lines. They all look the same. Aldopentoses have three chi chiral carbons. And the aldotetroses have two chiral carbons. Yeah, we've looked at erythrose and threos, I think. And aldotriose, that's glyceraldehyde. There's only one of them. And it only has one chiral carbon. So if the number of chiral carbons, 2 to the n, tells us the number of possible stereoisomers, then glucose should have how many? So 2 to the fourth is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Oh, wait a minute. That is 16, but there's not 16 shown here. Where are the rest of the isomers? Well, I kind of hinted at it before. All of the ones here shown are D isomers. So the remaining number, in other words, there's eight here. Um, eight are 
D isomers. The other eight are L. And what do they look like? Well, you do this. You flip this. This was done with an overhead acetate transparency, and I just flipped it over and put it in the copy machine to make the diagram. And so if you flipped all the chiral carbons, all the chiral carbons are in opposite orientations to make turn a D into an L. Now, they're not labeled correctly here. You can see that. But the other half of the isomers for each of these um, aldotetroses, pentoses, and hexoses are going to be their L isomers. They have all the chiral carbons going in exactly the opposite orientation. Aha. Hope that makes a little bit of sense. Kind of a funny thing to know. And notice that, I'll go back to the one you can read. Um, there are names for each of those different aldohexoses, most of which you do not need to know. A couple that you do, glucose and galactose are the two there. And the other one you need to know is ribose, where it has all the OH groups on one side. Fructose is the other one that's a monosaccharide to know, but it is a ketohexose. It's not on this diagram. All right, so let's test it out, see what we know. Which ones of these are D sugars? Which ones are L sugars? Can we handle it? I hope so. So looking at these from the top, I believe this is the same one we looked at earlier, where we decided that these two were enantiomers, right? Enantiomers, they're mirror image forms, mirror images of each other. And if so, all of the orientations of the chiral carbons are exactly opposite from the top one to, the op to its enantiomer. In other words, three OH groups on the right for the top three chiral carbons at the top and it on the left for the, its enantiomer. The last chiral carbon is on the left for that structure at the top, and it's at the right at the bottom. So that's the one that determines D versus L. When it's on this side for the last chiral carbon, notice that all four in the middle are chiral. That is an L isomer. This one is D. Um, if you look at the rest of the structures on this page, are there any other L sugars? Well, we're looking at the last chiral carbon in each case. And in each of these diagrams, the OH is on the right. So this one is D. They're all D isomers in this set of examples. All right, one more thought here before I conclude this recording. D and L isomers of a sugar are enantiomers, the mirror image forms. Hold that thought. It takes a little while for it to make sense to you. And we're always looking at the chiral carbon atom farthest from the carbonyl, its highest number in that sense. So the molecule at the left is called allose. It happens to have all of its OH groups on the same side. And it's got a D form, and it's got an L form. And the D and L forms differ in their positions of all their chiral carbons. We don't worry about the non-chiral ones, because there is no orientation that matters for them. They've got different their non-chiral things to represent. So they're all on the right for D allose. They're all on the left for L, L allose. For glucose, I told you the pattern once I mentioned that right, left, right, right fits this molecule glucose for its pattern of OH groups. Its L form is going to be exactly the opposite. It's going to be left, right, left, left, if you're working down from the top. That's one way to realize that these are enantiomers. They're exactly the opposite in all of their chiral carbons. Um, I will go back one thought here to the previous slide, remembering that this compound here is a diastereomer to whoops, the rest of the structures that are not its enantiomers. So these are diastereomers to one another. All righty. I hope that helps you get a grip on some of these little topics for carbohydrates. Um, a lot of this is sheer memorization. You'll get a chance to practice it on your homework. Um, but it's mostly memorization. So I hope you make use of the recording. And ask questions as necessary. Keep working on that homework. It's available soon, if it's not already. And I'll see you in class.